Welcome to Educational Alpha. I'm Bill Kelly, CEO of Kai Association and your host, bringing you on the ground conversations with business leaders, educators, and industry colleagues from around the globe. Educational Alpha is sponsored by iCapital, the financial technology company with the mission to power the world's alternative investment marketplace. Part innovator, part educator, and part navigator of the alternatives industry, iCapital offers intuitive, scalable digital solutions that have transformed how private market and hedge fund investments are bought and sold. With iCapital, financial advisors, wealth managers, and asset managers around the world now have access to everything they need to deliver the return and diversification potential of alternatives to high net worth investors. To learn more, visit iCapital.com. In this episode of Educational Alpha, Bill, along with special guests Chris Tarui and Aaron Philbeck, examine the evolving landscape of investments, highlighting the crucial role of education and democratization in asset management. They discuss the potential shift of trillions of dollars into alternative investments, emphasizing informed decision-making and responsible leadership. The conversation explores regulatory aspects, technology's role in democratization, and the significant impact of manager selection on investment outcomes. As the industry stands at a crossroads, they advocate for a cautious and educated approach, highlighting the potential for long-term growth and diversified portfolios. Chris Tarui and Aaron Philback, welcome to Educational Alpha. Thank you, Bill. Good to be here. Thanks, Bill. Long-time listener, first-time caller. I appreciate that feedback. Thank you. I'm going to try to make you into a long-time caller as well as a long-time listener. So this is an interesting challenge, but I've done this once already where I've had two guests at one time. So I had uh, Jen and Alex from Aruna Digital, and it worked quite well. So this is a work in progress to some degree, not the usual platform, but trying to make this open and conversational. And if you want to question each other, I'm happy to sit back and just observe too. But maybe sticking to a little bit of the format, I've always asked the guests to talk a little bit about their backgrounds and what brings them to this conversation. And what we're ultimately going to be talking about is the retirement promise and the retirement responsibility. And more and more, that's less on the institution delivering a defined benefit and more on us trying to control a defined contribution where we're judge and jury. And if we do it right or wrong, we only have ourselves to answer for that when trying to handle investment risk, longevity risk, geopolitical risk, and the list goes on and on. And having access to greater product to do that is a good headline. How we get there is a very complicated news story. And I'm not going to say we're going to solve for that in 30 to 40 minutes today, but try to bring greater enlightenment. So starting back at the beginning, Chris, maybe a little bit about your background. I know you've got a very complex title and set of responsibilities at T-Row, and you could talk a little bit about that, but maybe also mention what got Chris to where he is today. So just to get the title out of the way, I lead U.S. consultant relations as well as our OCIO or Outsourced Chief Investment Officer strategy, as well as global alternatives distribution for T-Row. And I've been here now for about two and a half years. You know, what ultimately the path bill, it's interesting to me, given the topic of today's conversation and the focus that we've shared on the democratization of alternatives, what originally made me aware of the investment management industry were the fact that my parents are now retired public school teachers. But as a kid around the dinner table, hearing about CalSTRS and this notion of a pension, it led to a lot of conversations around, well, how does that work? And what do you mean upon retirement, you continue to get paid? How could that be? Who knew at the time? But those were some formative conversations, just raising my awareness of how the world works how retirement works. And ultimately, I've had the privilege of 20 plus years of serving institutional investors almost throughout. So I started out at GMO in the early 2000s. Fresh out of undergrad, I walked the streets of Boston with a handful of paper resumes, a MapQuest printout, and a coat and went door to door looking for work. They were kind enough to offer me a job. A handful of years later, PIMCO, and I grew up in Southern California, an opportunity came up there to go write RFPs. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I'll get paid to learn about products and solutions. And we'll learn how the institutional investment capital raising process works. 
I was at PIMCO for just about six years. And then we were talking about alternatives. And lo and behold, Bridgewater came calling in 2011. And I thought, well, that's pretty neat. There seems to be this major institutional thrust into this category. Why not go learn it from one of the biggest and the best? So I joined Bridgewater in Connecticut in 2011. Was there for about five or six years, leading their institutional practice in the Northeast and on the West Coast. And then KKR was an opportunity that came about. And I thought, well, interesting. Now, private markets seem to be such a, a huge focus. Go learn from some of the best and the brightest over there. And then after that, I went back to PIMCO in 2018, the Bill Gross, post-Bill Gross era. In the post-Bill Gross era, focused more on the alternatives platform of PIMCO. Really was enjoying my time. And then this opportunity at T-Row came to come and help build an alternatives platform for a world-class franchise. So that's 20 some odd years in three minutes. Thanks for that. And it's a great infomercial as to why Aaron selected you and your gravitas to be on this advisory board for Unify, which we're going to get to in a second. But you were a member before you were a colleague, and you're a member and a credential gatherer to many degrees, and not for the sake of gathering them, but you believe in transparency, believe in education, and maybe a bit on your background before we get into the heart of the matter here. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. We could probably do a whole podcast episode on every single designation that's out there, but we'll put that aside for a second. My background is probably a lot shorter than Chris's, so I probably won't take as much time to walk through all of that. I've grown up around finance my entire life. Both my parents are academics. My dad is a finance professor, grew up around the credentialing space. Education has kind of been core to our family and family values. So kind of came into this industry already somewhat familiar with it, which certainly helped get my bearings as I looked around at all the different opportunities that were out there. I started my career in private wealth management, working for an RIA in Columbus, Ohio called the Joseph Group Capital Management. We worked with high net worth individuals. So a typical client of ours was a doctor or an attorney that had somewhere between one and $10 million in retirement assets that they've accrued over a long period of time. And we were trying to help them either get towards their stage of retirement or in the process of getting them retired and into that distribution phase. We also worked with a lot of retirement plans, corporate retirement plans, sponsors in particular in terms of setting up their investment options and working with plan participants to make sure that they were on track with their investments as well. So I started off as an investment analyst, doing a lot of manager research, both across traditional investments, but also a pretty healthy dose of alternative investments. Became a portfolio manager after that, where I focused a lot on asset allocation, portfolio construction, and how all of those managers, again, fit together across the board of traditional and alternative investment strategies. And then I happened to see this posting for Kaya on our curriculum and exams team for the Kaya designation and reached out and said, hey, we would love to have a conversation. And lo and behold, Bill, uh, we followed each other on Twitter and social media and felt like we had known each other for a long time despite never meeting. So joined Kaya on the curriculum and exams team on the designation. And since then, I've had a variety of different roles, including running content and thought leadership for a number of years. And then most recently, working on this Unify effort, overseeing the product, but also curriculum development, certainly being out there and talking about that and the efforts that we're doing in that area as well. Glad we hit the bid with you, Aaron, and maybe the lottery too. So maybe to get a little bit ahead of ourselves, but then backtrack as well, ahead of ourselves as to why we're here. And I think this podcast is going to be launched at or about the same time we're going to unveil probably the preeminent reason why Unify exists in the first place. And I'll have you explain Unify in a second, Aaron. But Kaya now is 22 years old and really cut our teeth around the mass adoption of the endowment model. And that model is now 50 years old. But in the late 1990s, we saw greater and greater institutional adoption of alt. And, and we wanted to be an answer for the CIO office in terms of how they allocate to this uncorrelated risk premium for maybe the very first time. And our relevancy there is very much alive and well. But we're now well into this democratization phase. And some of the clients that both Aaron, you and Chris have dealt with early on in your career are coming to the trough and they're saying, I need greater diversification. And particularly coming out of 2022, we saw great correlation between public equity and public bonds. The client wants more. 
and they want more, but this should not necessarily be the place you go for upside return. You've got to be very thoughtful. You have a long-term lens, et cetera. We at Kaya created something called the Fundamentals of Alternative Investment, FAI for short, about a decade ago. And even there, it was meant to be an answer to the wholesaler that is now bringing an uncorrelated 40 act mutual fund or a USA to the market for the first time when they're used to talking about equity or fixed income, long-term funds, or some kind of a balanced fund. As we get on to this next decade, we could have said, well, how do we up Great look and feel of FAI. But then we took a step back and the value proposition was more complex than that. We said, well, should we not try to find a way of having this horizontal offering maybe pieced together with some spurts of learning? Because now you not only have democratization taking hold, you have RIAs that might be in their 50s or 60s. And for the first time, client is asking them about infrastructure or sustainable investments, impact investments, maybe even virtual currencies. And how can we be an answer there? So I think we took a step back and said, well, when it came to institutional alts, we kind of knew that space and we didn't need a whole bunch of experts. We needed a couple of smart CIOs. But then when it comes to democratization, what's in the hearts, minds and souls of the people at the coalface like T. Rowe for Chris and more broadly speaking, the asset managers, the wirehouses, the RIA space? And this is space we don't really know. We don't know how that conversation to take place. And the most valuable piece of feedback we got early on from Chris and co was really got to be thinking about it from the client's perspective, a goal-based approach. But Aaron, maybe I'll start with you and I'll turn to Chris about why it was important to get this advisory committee put together in the first place. And maybe you can use that as an opportunity to maybe build out exactly what Unify is all about. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot that you said there that I I can underscore, Bill, I think a lot of that is very important. If I back up and just think before we get to Unify, just where we're at in this industry, there's a lot of different ways to measure the universe of what's investable, but we do our best to try to make that estimation. We look at alternatives as being about around a $20 trillion grouping of different strategies, private equity, hedge funds, private credit, infrastructure, real estate, all these asset classes that you just mentioned. And the question that we're asking ourselves is 20 trillion today encompasses a very long history of institutional allocations and where the endowments, the foundations, the sovereign wealth funds are putting their capital to work. But what does the next 20 trillion look like? And my guess is, and I think a lot of our guesses are, that some of that institutional allocations will continue and it will probably be a very large portion of the next 20 trillion. But There's a lot of new players that are investing in these strategies, wirehouses, private banks, RIAs, individual investors. And so as we were thinking about, we've got this institutional body of knowledge at Kaya with the Kaya designation, and we're training the CIOs and the analysts and the portfolio managers to think about allocating across all these different strategies. How are we going to train this next wave of investors who are new to a lot of these different asset classes and strategies that they're trying to think through in their own portfolios. And a lot of the change, as you mentioned, Bill, has come from a couple of different drivers. Uh, The easiest way to summarize this is supply and demand with maybe a sprinkle of access sprinkled in there as well. On one hand, on the demand side, we have years like 2022, which was one of the worst years for a 60-40 portfolio in traditional markets in almost four decades. So people aren't necessarily going out and saying, well, I need alternatives, but they're thinking, I need a better diversified solution in my portfolio so that I can weather these storms within my portfolio. So diversification and thinking about diversification from a standpoint of the broader tool set and the toolbox that's available to the investor, I think is one element. On the supply side, you have a lot of firms that are trying to think through solutions to democratize access. Historically, Working with the institutional investors, many of the firms that Chris mentioned have great relationships with institutions, but they're trying to figure out how can I take these strategies that institutional investors get to enjoy just due to structure or illiquidity or whatever the reason, and how do I make that accessible to the individual investor? And so kind of have these supply and demand forces coming together of, I need diversification and I need to create something that's going to be accessible. And then access kind of sprinkled over all of that being a key gas on the flame, if you will, of new structures, new platforms that allow access 
making it easier for the individual investor to access all of these things. So there's a lot of things swimming in all of that on the supply, demand, and access side. But as we looked at Unify, and at that point, it didn't even have a name, which is very hard to believe. We wanted to create some kind of educational experience. We landed on being a platform building off of the foundations of our fundamentals program that would help educate everyone across the supply and demand chain. So you think about the asset management firms like a T. Rowe Price or Chris is at that are thinking through distribution strategies, reaching this new clientele, all the way down to the individual advisors at the wirehouses and the RAAs that need to get up to speed on how these different strategies work. And if we can have all of those players speak the same language and understand how these strategies fit in a portfolio, the appropriateness of these strategies for different client profiles, then to us, that's a win for the industry. And it's a win for all the different players involved. I'm happy to talk through how the platform works, but maybe I'll pause there. I've thrown a lot back at you, Bill. I know. I appreciate that, Aaron. And maybe we will cover all of this, but maybe Chris, uh, having you add to this and maybe with a little bit of finishing remark to what Aaron said, when we approached you specifically and organizations like T. Rowe, nobody turned us down. And the value proposition was, I can't pay you anything and I want some of your time. And the very easy answer would be, I have my own commercial interest. Thank you very much, but I'm moving on. Nobody turned us down, and everybody came armed with the fact that what we're trying to do in that conference room, on that webinar, was very, very important, not only to you and your brand, but to the industry. I think so highly of you and T. Rowe and everybody around that table that this was an important investment that you chose to make. So, uh, so thank you for that. Maybe you can either draft off that or talk about what's in the hearts, minds, and souls of the wealth management client, knowing that wealth is not up to the industry to define. Everybody has wealth. We want more of it, but it's my wealth and I need you to help me manage it. And if you're going to have cutoffs about, well, you only have access to this with this amount of money, sometimes business decisions need to be made. But we have to put the interest of the client first and foremost, regardless of what their size is. And maybe talk about what are some of the things they worry about and how we as an industry, maybe through Unify and other platforms, can do a better job of delivering on that value proposition. It was a true privilege to join this group of folks that bring different lenses from the industry to try and help drive a vision for education and what that means in the what I'll call the two-legged investor space. I have personal conviction. I shared how I got started vis-a-vis the conversations around the dinner table as two pensioners talking about their retirement. t itself has a 90-year history of focusing on outcome-based investing, helping investors of all shapes and sizes meet their objectives. And when you think about the secular shift that is about to unfold here, let's just set the stage. You have something like $100 trillion in global assets under management. Roughly 50 to 55% of that is in individual, aggregated by individual X401k investors. So that's 55 trillion. And the underlying asset allocations there suggest that one, maybe 2% of their existing portfolio is invested in alternatives. So if it's right that various studies are suggesting that that allocation grows to 3, 4, or 5% in the next 3, 4, or 5 years. I mean, the math suggests trillions of dollars of two-legged investor savings moving into this space. And certainly over time, if that 3 to 5% converges toward what we see on the institutional side, which is closer to 20 or 25% allocations to alternatives, this is going to be an extraordinary shift. That's why this matters so much. And For me personally, it's exciting, but it is also a tool that you're putting into people's hands that needs to be framed and used responsibly. What do I mean by that? What are alternatives? I think we have to start there as an industry and really frame the conversation. Alternatives is this amorphous category. I think the easiest way to think about it is it's not beta. It's not common stocks, bonds, cash, commodities. And if it's not that, then is it alpha? call it what you want, but it's skill-based investing. So what does that mean? It means that the outcome that you're going to get in manager A, even in the same category of call it hedge funds or what have you, could look very different than your outcome if you invest with manager B because it's a skill-based process. So 
with that sort of dispersion as a reality, education is everything for the end user. What are these tools designed to do? What can they be relied on? What can they not be relied on to do? And I think part of what we've been working on together as a group is really creating a digestible taxonomy around these categories. So I, I think of the world as there's stuff that you want because you're hungry for more return. And there's stuff that you want because you're afraid that the dominant risk in your portfolio, and for most people, let's just face it, that's stock market risk, is too high. And you want other things that have a return potential that isn't reliant on what you see on CNBC you know, in terms of the direction of the stock market. And then you've really got to work with the end user to define all of those categories in each of those two buckets. And I think if done well, the secular potential here to put these valuable tools in their portfolios, it's incredibly exciting. But I think there has to be some level of sobriety as we go into this. And so for Tiro, we thought a lot about creating our own sort of branded education. But the beauty of the partnership with Kaya is that I think it allows us to hand over heart, say to our end users, to our clients, the education that you're going to get here that we're partnering with Kaya on has nothing to do with our platform. It has nothing to do with our products. It has nothing to do with wanting to move you in a certain direction. And the belief that if that's done well, the rest of the commercial aspects take care of itself. And so there's a strong aligned shared beliefs that have been manifesting themselves since I joined this working group a year or so ago. It's been great. So just a quick follow-up before I turn back to Aaron. The narrative about a third alt bucket, I'm not saying it's the wrong narrative, it sometimes makes me nervous because now we're creating this third bucket beyond the 60 and the 40 of public equity and public debt, as opposed to everything's an alternative to something else. And I think if the investor can think about greater diversification across uncorrelated risk premia, that is a very, very good outcome. And then how they access it and why. But I do worry that if investors think about, well, I've got to get up to 20% in all, so otherwise I'm not going to have a comfortable retirement. And this is a lot of what we try to bring forward with Unify to fill in some of these gaps. And I think even in a, an equity portfolio, you don't want to own one sector or one industry or be all US. So I think this concept, I think in the psyche of the investor, it's always been there. If we can bring the argument and discussion around you have more options in front of you, full stop. And why just do two? So is that a fair way to be looking at it? Or is there another side to that argument? I'll quickly share, Aaron, and would value your feedback as well. But I think that's fair. What I personally worry most about is expectation setting. If you invest in private equity, you believe that you're getting something that is not related to fundamental economics, I would take issue with that, right? If the S&P craters 25%. What's bad for public equities is bad for private equity. And do underlying investors understand that that relationship exists? What's bad for high yield is bad generally for private credit. And so I think as a working group, we've spent a lot of time, I think, trying to unpack these foundational frameworks for the retail investor to understand fundamentally based on what these managers are doing in these categories, what should you expect of these investments? They're not some panacea where they always work all the time. There are linkages to markets. Now, in the absolute return space, Bill, to your point about uncorrelated, call it alpha, there, the goal, I think, is different. It is, in fact, to be able to drive returns that are completely indifferent to what's happening in financial markets. But there again, there needs to be a disclaimer. If you're a manager that's out without a benchmark, you're a SOFR plus 500, 1,000 type investor, what are you doing and underlying that portfolio? And what is the expected reliability of that alpha? And it's not a guarantee that that return is there. You're underwriting the skill set and the quality of decision making of that manager. And that's very different than going out and buying an SPY ETF. You don't have the safety and the comfort of market risk premium at, at your back. These are decisions that you as the two-legged investor have to live with with respect to skill-based investing. And I think that's a really important 
facet of the education that, that we've all been talking about. Yeah, no, I think very valid points. And Aaron, maybe segueing to you, Dodd and Frank made it very difficult for Diamond and Moynihan to stay in the lending business. And then we have a regulatory environment and a flow of capital that made private equity a much better place to be than public equity. So I think there's been these glacial first and rapidly moving forces that have changed the equity and debt markets and maybe a lot of components associated with that. And talk about complexity premiums and illiquidity premiums and yield and private debt. But I think the reality is for reasons you can elaborate upon, value creation and opportunity is happening more and more in the private markets full stop. And we as responsible people for own retirement have to get access to that. So I'll let you maybe run with that, that maybe observation more than a question. If I can tie together what you've said and what Chris has said, I think that culminates to a lot of the work that we've been doing on this unified platform with this advisory committee, but also how we think about that foundational education, which is so important to set expectations, to use Chris's words. There's a couple things that we made sure that we did when we created this revamped, reimagined fundamentals program that hit on some of those things. One is the access component that you mentioned, Bill, to illiquidity, illiquid assets, where the capital formation is happening. That access today looks very different than it did 10, 15 years ago. And so trying to at least get a framework around what are those different access points, those different fund vehicles and liquidity profiles that are available for the individual investor, I think is really important because I think half the battle is understanding what's available to me, either from a regulatory perspective or from a behavioral perspective, what can I tolerate or what can my client tolerate from an illiquidity perspective? So we spend a lot of time thinking through that and helping the learner go through those different options from the most restrictive, the most illiquid to the most liquid. And what do you gain? What do you give up when you start moving across that spectrum? So tie together what Chris mentioned on setting expectations. There's two lenses that we took when we were thinking about education, which I think is pretty differentiated when you look at a lot of education that's out there around alternatives. One is, to Chris's point, this amorphous term of alternatives isn't really helpful for people because they kind of think of all this weird stuff that I'm just going to throw in the corner of my portfolio and it's just going to behave weird and erratic and move in a completely different direction. That's not necessarily the case. A lot of these strategies have ties to the traditional markets And how do we think about grouping them in a way that's going to be not only understandable for the client that the advisor is working with, but for the advisor themselves? How do I construct a portfolio that's going to be a little bit more informed in terms of the risks that I'm taking on? So what we did is we tried to really group the world of alternatives into their primary risk and return driver. So grouping things like private equity with more public equity-oriented alternatives. And the net result is you have things like venture capital sitting alongside things like long short equity, equity market neutral, not because they behave the same way, but because of that underlying economic exposure within the portfolio. There's equity, whether it's public or private. Same thing with credit. You've got private credit, direct lending, venture debt, all these private debt strategies sitting alongside long short credit or structured credit. Not because, again, they behave the same way, but because of that underlying risk driver. You can make the same argument for real assets, this physical tie to the world. And then as Chris mentioned, there's all this other stuff that is hard to put together. You've got hedge fund strategies that move in different directions in the market. It's a skill-based types of strategies that are out there. But then you also have some weird esoteric assets like insurance, like securities or litigation finance that are maybe borrowing from some of the risk drivers of the other asset classes that I previously mentioned, but they kind of move to their own beat. And so we try to kind of shrink the weirdness of alternatives into a smaller portion and then define the other elements of that. So I think from a portfolio construction perspective, that's really important. The overlay that I'll put on top of that, and Bill, you mentioned this at the very beginning, what the client's trying to accomplish. What is the goal that they're trying to achieve within their own portfolios? And how do these alternative strategies help the portfolio move towards that achievement of those goals? So if I step back again, we'll use equity as an example. Venture capital is going to be a much more growth-oriented strategy or asset class in achieving long-term aggressive growth in a portfolio, whereas long-short equity, 
yeah, there's some growth associated with it, but there's also downside protection. When you look at things like merger arbitrage and equity market neutral, you may not have as much growth in the portfolio, but you're still equity. So it's more downside protection oriented. And you can take this goals-based approach of achieving things like growth, income, inflation protection, and downside protection and apply them to the different alternative strategies that are out there, even if you're grouping them into asset classes or economic exposures that are very similar. Now, I think all very good points. So Chris, maybe taking some of that, maybe bringing it a little bit back to the here and now. And one of the most hated questions on an interview is, where are you going to be in five years? Well, who the hell knows? And especially if you're 20 years old, you're talking about 25% of their lifetime. So who knows? But I think it's important, maybe not in the next five, maybe the next three to five, how do we get from where we are to where we want to be? We are in a highly regulated industry. You've got regulation throughout the world. You've got legislation. Uh, you have responsibilities to your employer. We have education that needs to get further up the spectrum for the individual client. So there's a lot of things in the hopper, and I don't think anybody would take the other side that more diversification is worse, is better. Clearly, having more options is a better outcome. But we need a lot of things to move. We need legislation. We need regulation. We need enlightened consent from organizations like T. Rowe. We also need technology. iCapital is, and I'm appreciative of their sponsorship, the sponsor of this platform, and I think they're emblematic of a technology play that has to help bridge this gap between LP and GP. So I said a lot there, but maybe talk about some of the obstacles and how do we overcome those up to including and maybe difficult as a regulated entity to talk about why regulation needs to evolve. That's not your remit. I'm happy to have riffed on that myself. But what are the various moving parts that we really need to be focused on to get the investor with eyeballs on a more opportunity? I think the regulatory piece is, is an important facet of we're really staring down a multi-trillion dollar torrent of assets flowing from individuals in the more complex strategies, complex structures. I think that oversight, when done well, is an important thing to ensure that these investors are protected. Certainly, that is true. And those comments are equally applied to the 401k space, where what witnessed 10, 15 years of litigation around these types of structures and how will that resolve itself over time? I'll leave that to people far smarter than I am to, to sort out. But to your point, Bill, clearly an important issue. The iCapital, the cases of the world, they're doing incredible work from the technology side. I and mean, what does democratization mean? Literally is defined as more equal access. The way that institutions have tapped these types of structures and investments it would be very laborious for an individual investor to figure out how to navigate all of that access point or for an advisor to put X number of his or her underlying clients into these complex structures and the taxes and the documents, et cetera. So that, I think, is a hugely important partnership, and they're driving innovation there that is going to be crucial. The structures that GPs continue to innovate around that are fitting for the end investor, so long as they're aware of, if we do offer quarterly liquidity up to 5% of the NAV, that doesn't guarantee that your full needs will be met. As long as that education is there on these structures, then I think we'll be okay. But Bill, your question is, how do we really make meaningful progress over the next three to five years? I just sit here and visualize what it would be like to be an advisor, pick a city in middle America, and you've got hundreds of clients that are asking these questions that you've never been confronted by. If you're actually going to move them from a zero allocation or a 1% allocation to a five, there's so much that you as an advisor have to get comfortable with, up to speed on. And if we don't do that well, then a lot of the estimates around the potential growth here are probably going to be short of what's actually realized, because I just can't imagine an, an advisor pushing their clients into these complex portfolios and structures without getting deeply comfortable. And what we know to be true is that maybe there's 5 to 10% of the advisor population nationally that are power users. They tend to sit in more urban markets like the New York area, the LA area, where that wealth has forced that market to mature and evolve into these more complex alternatives. But for everywhere else, in those markets that have, that have yet to really go down that path, 
there is no substitute for education. I think that that has to be the focal point. I agree. And Chris, just sticking with this theme for a moment, somebody sent to me a piece of recent research and a piece that Larry Siegel put out. Don't know exactly what his background is, but he's a thoughtful researcher, has done a lot in this space. And the thesis he brought forward in this piece that he wrote was that the cutoff was under 10 million in assets. He didn't think that clients should be playing in the alt space. And he's a pro endowment fund, pro alts kind of guy. But it was an interesting observation. I agreed with some of it, maybe not all of it, but I think one of the most important things he brought forward is long-termism. And I'm not going to get this completely right, but from memory, he looked at a study that Morningstar had done. And he looked at the delta between how the fund did versus how the average investor did. And in long-term equity and fixed income funds, they were leaving a couple hundred basis points of return on the table because their market timing in and out, in and out. It was even worse with liquid alts. But when it came to the target date funds, the retirement space, the average investor did better than the fund. How's that possible? Dollar cost averaging every two weeks. When they worry about the market, they don't worry about the 401k. It's out of sight, out of mind. You can agree with this wholeheartedly or take the other side, but how important is long-termism? Because if you're going to be looking for this fund or this private equity investment to solve my problems next quarter when you want liquidity, if you don't like it, I guarantee you that's not going to work. So maybe you can talk a little bit about why long-termism is or is not important from your perspective. I fully agree with that premise. Over the years, just personally, I've learned that I'm a terrible investor. My ability to time in and out is notoriously bad. In fact, you could probably launch a very successful hedge fund contra trading my ideas and timing. So I think that's, that is an incredibly important facet of this. I'll cite someone in the industry that I've known a long time, Tim Price. He's the CIO of Contra Costa's pension plan. And he's done some really important work on what he described from an asset allocation perspective of the functionally focused portfolio. And I've shared this with him. It's a white paper that I push to, to contacts of mine all the time because to me, long-termism is a function of a deep appreciation for why you're doing something. What function is it supposed to serve? And I think it, it sort of rhymes with what Aaron had shared, but there are buckets that I think investors need in their minds. There's a liquidity bucket. I've got a mortgage payment. I've got a tuition payment. I've got a car payment. Maybe I should be rolling two-month or six-month T-bills in that bucket, but that is one area of a function of my portfolio that I'm relying on. There are other areas that say, I need things that are not going to go down as much or at the same time when the other stuff that I have is experiencing that type of pain. Okay, got it. So now I can filter for strategies that don't have an inherent bias to behave in the same way as those other things that sit in what you can call a growth bucket. I want to grow my wealth in this bucket. And that includes things like venture, private equity, public market assets, equities, high yield, etc. But I think you have to commit yourself to that mindset of like, what function is this investment serving? Otherwise, Bill, to your point, you're destined to destroy value. So Aaron, maybe building this theme, if I think about a first cousin or a sibling of long-termism, it's manager selection. And uh, I don't know Tim at Contra Costa, but I'm assuming a very smart guy. He has a CIO network. He has consultants he can pull from. And he's got a little bit of an edge around manager selection. The individual, mass affluent, high net worth, it doesn't really matter. If they're going to an RIA, the RIA does not have that product on their shelf. They in turn have to go someplace else. So we are in a space where dispersion is wide and manager selection is the name of the game. So again, you can comment on that and how important recognizing that fact is around why education and transparency matters so much at the starting point of allocation to alts. Manager selection is such an important element in selecting alternative strategies and Maybe going back to your 401k comment, Bill, on target date funds, perhaps whoever cracks this case really opens the floodgates because that is the place where you have a long-term vehicle to invest in a lot of these strategies that people aren't touching. And so that could be one of the first places that we see 
broader adoption if someone's able to do it. It's professionally managed, which comes down to the manager selection conversation, because rather than you being forced to select managers in a particular asset class, you're deferring that to a professional who is doing that. So it goes back to the old pension type of model. But I think going back to manager selection, just as a concept, I think this is where it comes back to what Chris mentioned in terms of setting expectations. And not only do you need to select the right manager, but you need to be good at selecting those right managers. And so being open with yourself as a firm behind the resources that you're able to put behind going directly through funds versus an intermediary, I think that's an important conversation to have because if you go in blindly going into selecting a venture capital fund, which is notorious for the best funds being closed, you're going to have a bad outcome. So I think it comes down to setting expectations for your firm's process and what you're willing to get into versus not. Yeah, I agree. Moving toward wrap up, and I'm going to ask both of you to make some closing observations. I think by length already, this is going to be the longest educational alpha podcast, but I think on a subject matter that means a lot to me, a lot to both of you, and particularly a lot to potential and real investors in the marketplace today. So Chris, maybe starting with you, and maybe I can posit maybe a, a closing observation from my side. I think we're sitting at a crossroads where education and democratization are coming together. And if I think about the traffic light there, what color should be flashing? In my view, it should be flashing red, not solid red, but flashing red. And do not proceed unless there's several threshold questions you can answer. And some of these things we just talked about, your tolerance for illiquidity, your views toward long-termism, your ability to have a bit of an edge and manage a selection. And that's just my top three. There are probably more there. But but I think this whole conversation has been about not proceed with a screaming green light or yield. It's more that take a pause, make sure you're equipped with the very right tools, find the right partner and move ahead. Now, turning it to you, just a capstone observation on why this discussion matters, why Unify matters, why it's going to make T. Rowe a better manager, why it's going to put your clients into a better position in terms of outcomes. Speaking for Tiro, we are taking a very judicious pace here but for all the reasons that you described. You have to start with the education. I would agree with your stoplight reference. Nobody should be waving this in. We are working very closely with these advisors on education in partnership with all of you. Just to underscore Aaron, the, the manager selection point, some of the comments that Aaron made, if you hire Tiro in a high yield bond fund or versus PIMCO and a high-yield bond fund, the dispersion you're going to get between the two is not going to be black and white night and day. One may outperform the other by 50 to 100 basis points. But if you hire private equity manager or venture managers A versus B, the outcomes of who you selected can be dramatically different. And so I think this is where that education needs to occur. I think it can be done really well. I've been so encouraged by my peers that sit in this advisory group, from the feedback that I'm getting from colleagues in the field about the judicious pace that the industry is taking toward this. And I think I'm biased, but I don't know that there's a better steward of this conversation than Kaya. And I think we're making tremendous strides toward standing up a body of content that will enable, Bill, is what you described, a three, four, five-year journey that gets people where they need to be to make informed decisions. Thanks, Chris. And I'm very appreciative of those remarks, your friendship, the gravitas you and T. Rowe bring to the mix. So thank you. Aaron, uh, closing observations from your side about Unify and why your day job matters so much to the untold and untouched investor. And hopefully some of them will realize the great work you're doing. I would echo a lot of what Chris said. And maybe just to add very quickly, just... Being informed before you invest is the first step, and it's the most important step. If you don't set expectations for yourself and for your clients, then it's going to be a bad outcome at some point. It may not be the first time you do it, but you have to go in informed. Otherwise, worse outcomes for the client. And the official launch date for the next version of FAI is, is when? January 10th. Not sure when this will air, but we have a big event coming up in New York City. And I think it's already oversubscribed. We may need to move into the convention center, but that's a good problem to have. Chris, Aaron, thank you for joining me. I thought it was a great conversation. 
the challenge and opportunity for ourselves and ultimately the opportunity side for the client is in front of us. If we do this right, I think there's a lot of basis points to be spread around and putting the client first is something both of you live and breathe. And I'm very appreciative of the conversation and the great work that both of you do. It's a pleasure to be here with both of you. And I look forward to the continued partnership. It's been excellent. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Bill. Thank you for listening to Educational Alpha. I'm your host, Bill Kelly. Learn more about the Kaya Association and subscribe to the show at kaya.org. That's C-A-I-A.org. See you next time.